Hi there and welcome to this Monday Night Lectures for Schools brought to you by the Department of Geography, Royal Holloway, University of London. My name's Ian, I'm a Professor of Geography here at the Department of Geography and today I'm going to be uh, bringing you a lecture entitled Drylands in a Changing World. So I thought I would start this uh, talk tonight just with an image, okay, and it's an image which many people would think of as quite a standard view of a dryland, okay. So here we have low vegetation landscape, rolling sand dunes, a typical image that most people would think of when they think about drylands or deserts. But one of the reasons I've put this photo up to start the talk with is because in the foreground, what you can also see is this low flat area of whitish sediment. This sediment are sediments deposited within a lake basin. And not a ephemeral shallow pond which was flooded for a few days and then dried out. This would have been, when it existed, a perennial permanent lake basin, several meters deep, fully fresh water, and in those sediments, not only do we find microscopic evidence for freshwater conditions and an open grassland, lush savanna environment, but we also find the remains of animals such as hippos and crocodiles, which would have needed permanent water bodies to be able to survive and exist. And the reason I've started with this image today is just simply to get across this idea that drylands are almost always in some kind of state of flux. Naturally, over time, they expand, they contract, they become wet, they become humid, they become vegetated, and then they become dry again. Deserts are never in a permanent dry state, they're always changing. That's true of the past. And one of the things I'd like to finish on to, in my lecture today is also to highlight that actually that's true of the future. Most of our climate predictions indicate that the result of global warming in the dry regions of the world will be a major change in precipitation regime, which will typically cause most major deserts to expand and the near desert areas to become semi-arid dryland environments as well. Okay, so in the lecture today, I just want to sort of take you through a few key ideas when we're dealing with drylands in a changing world. And I thought the first thing I would do would be introduce myself. Um, so my name is Ian, I'm a professor of geography, and a lot of my work involves the study of dryland regions around the world. So I do quite a lot of work in North Africa, I've worked in Tunisia and Morocco, or the northern edge of the Sahara. I've worked in the Nafud de Desert on the Arabian Peninsula. But I've also, there's a hot deserts, I've also worked in cold deserts. So I've worked in the desert regions of Central Asia. I've worked in areas like Mongolia. And it's probably sad to say, but my first uh, love of deserts actually came from uh, watching the original Star Wars films. So you see the opening parts of the, the first Star Wars films, these big desert environments, these rolling sand dunes, these big open vistas. And even as a young kid, I thought to myself, wow, but what a beautiful landscape. This kind of really, really lonely, windswept, almost endless seeming landscape. And I think that was where my love of uh, deserts and drylands first started. Interestingly enough, um, you know, only a few years ago, I was working in Tunisia where they filmed the first of those Star Wars films and the Bill, the uh, Tunisian geographer I was working with, found out I liked Star Trek, Star Wars, and he said, oh, would you like to go and see the sets? And I said, what do you mean the sets? And he said, oh, well, the sets are still up in the desert. So we went out into the, into the desert and, and saw the, uh, the Star Wars towns which were set up there. Um, my first real experience of the desert or dryland came when I was an undergraduate. So I did my degree at Royal Holloway. I've worked at Royal Holloway, but I was also a student here. And on our first year field trip to Spain, was my first experience of working in a desert or a dryland. We went to South East Spain, one of the driest parts of Europe, probably the one part of Europe which can be considered desert or semi-desert. And there you have these beautiful, what, what are referred to as badlands. Badlands because they're bad because nothing grows there. And you have this amazing landscape where all of the soil has been eroded away. And what you see is erosion into the underlying fine sediments. And it was my first experience of working in, in deserts. And I continued to work there um, during the course of my PhD, my, the research I did after I finished my degree. And now, as I say, I, I work quite a lot in drylands. Um, my main interest is actually 
changing drylands environments, how do drylands change over time. So a lot of the time I'm trying to reconstruct how deserts or drylands have expanded or contracted in the past. And a lot of the time that involves me working with archaeologists because deserts are very often important areas for human dispersal. They're, they're barriers that in the early stages of, of, of human evolution or the expansion of Homo sapiens, we've had to trans, uh, traverse deserts, we've had to cross them, and periods of time when the climate was wetter and those desert regions become passable, you get water, surface water bodies, you get lush savanna environment with lots of animals to hunt, that's periods of time when humans can migrate across deserts. So, as I said, I've worked in the Sahara, I've worked in the Arabian Peninsula, and very recently, myself and colleagues from the Department of Geography, Royal Holloway, and colleagues working in, in Germany, but also colleagues from Arabia, we published a paper looking at evidence for early humans because we found a trail of footprints, fossil footprints from 100,000 years ago across a former lake bed showing the uh, migration of humans and actually being able to see their footprints preserved in the sediment. So that's me. What I want to do today is a very simple series of sections really introducing you to key concepts of drylands. So the first thing I want to think about are what, what are drylands? How do we classify drylands? The second thing is why do we get drylands? There are areas of major deserts, but areas of dry conditions around the world. Why do they occur where they do? The third thing I want to think about is why do drylands change? Why in the past have deserts expanded and, and contracted? And the final thing I want to think about is how will deserts change in the future? What are climate scientists saying will happen to uh, deserts as the climate changes in the future as a result of global warming? So let's think about that first thing, what are drylands? Okay, now I've already shown you the image which I think a lot of people have in their minds when they think of drylands, these big rolling sand dunes. And, and certainly a lot of drylands are deserts, but actually drylands, the term drylands encompasses quite a wide range of climatic zones. And the one thing that drylands have in common around the world is obviously a deficit of moisture. So you're talking about regions which are under moisture stress, which receive relatively little pre precipitation. The way we classify drylands is through the aridity index. Okay? And the aridity in index is actually quite simple. It's the balance between the moisture that comes into a region and the moisture which is lost from the region. So very simply, it's a ratio between precipitation annual precipitation, so the amount of rainfall that a region receives a year, divided by the amount of water that that region loses, either via evaporation, so direct loss straight back into the atmosphere, or transpiration, loss of water through plant systems. And effectively, once you get to a value in a reading index of one or lower, you start to move into what we call uh, drylands. And drylands are on a scale, okay? So you have the wettest of drylands are the dry subhumid regions. So lots of the Mediterranean, for example, the northern part of the Mediterranean would be classified as dry subhumid. Then you have semi-arid, okay? So if you move into say areas like southern Spain, southern Italy, southern Greece, the really dry parts of the Mediterranean, that would be classified as semi-arid. Then we have the arid regions, so areas like uh, parts of the Sahara, parts of the Kalahari Desert, parts of the Gobi Desert, and then hyperarid, the driest of dry regions, okay? Areas with really low levels of rainfall, um, and you might be talking about the very driest parts of the main deserts of the world. Now, importantly, if you think about that as a classification, that means that just over 40% of the entire continental surface of the Earth are actually classified as drylands. So we're not dealing with a, a small, uh, locally specific climate region. We are talking about nearly half of the world's land surface being classified as drylands. 
Now, as a consequence of that, we're actually dealing with a climatic region which affects huge amounts of the world's population. So it's estimated that almost 35% of the world's populations live within dry land conditions. Now, of course, the majority of them don't live in the hyperarid or the arid conditions. Most of them live within the semi-arid semi or the dry subhumid regions. So of that 35%, probably about 30% are living in the wetter parts of dryland. But they are still affected by a dry climate. And as we'll come on to at the end of this talk, um, actually the most climate predictions indicate that those semi-arid and dry subhumid regions, the, the drier parts, the, sorry, the wetter parts of dryland climates will actually become drier in the future. So about 30% of the world's populations currently living on the wetter part of the dryland spectrum will actually be affected by drier and drier conditions in the future. And it's likely that water resource management, water resource stress will become huge issues for that large percentage of the world population over the next 50 to 100 years. So now we have an idea about what drylands are, let's think about why they occur. And it's widely accepted that there are four main reasons why we get dryland or, or desert regions. Um, the first of these is continentality. Um, in many ways, this is quite straightforward. If you have a very large landmass, the centre of that landmass is a long way from the oceans, the oceans is the source of most moisture and most precipitation. So in an area like Central Asia, by the time the air mass has reached Central Asia, it's lost most of its moisture, most of the precipitation has fallen as rain by the time that the air mass gets to the centre of that continent. And by the time it gets there, there's no moisture left, there's very little precipitation, and so these regions become very dry. The second major cause of uh, drylands is what we would refer to as the rain shadow effect. So that's when you have an area of very high relief and air masses moving towards that area of high relief, those air masses rise. As they rise, they cool. As air cools, any water vapour condenses into rain clouds. Rainfall occurs and a large amount of the moisture that the air mass is carrying is lost in association with that high ground. And when the air mass moves across that mountain range or high ground, it's lost most of its moisture. So the area downwind of that mountain range is very dry because there's no moisture. So any area which is downwind from a major mountain range, and we can see this in areas like the Rockies in North America, we can also see this in some cases in, associated with the Andes in South America, you're dealing with areas of low precipitation, not because they're a long way from the ocean, but because between that area and the ocean is a major mountain range, you lose most of the moisture at that mountain range through precipitation, therefore the area downwind is very dry. Um, third way that you get drylands is actually you might get areas very close to an ocean source but that ocean is very cold. So areas where you get upwelling of water, so water at the ocean floor, the bottom of the ocean is very cold. In certain areas of the world and, and the west coast of South America is a good example the southwest coast of southern Africa is another example, you get upwelling of water from depth, and that means directly next to that landmass, the sea surface temperature is very cold. And because it's very cold, it's difficult to evaporate moisture from the sea surface into the atmosphere. The warmer the water, the easier it is for moisture to evaporate, and so warm seas produce a lot of atmospheric moisture and a lot of rain. But if you have a very cold sea surface, then the water doesn't evaporate very easily. And even though an area is right next to the coast, typically you find that the area is very dry. So areas like the Atacama Desert in South America, areas such as Namibia um, in southwestern Africa, 
those areas are right next to the coast, they're right next to a major source of moisture, but they don't get much rainfall because the ocean currents offshore produce extremely cold sea surface temperatures. Well, the final um, reason that we get drylands, and actually this is you know, one of the most important ones, but I've left it to last, so I want to explain it in a little bit more detail. And also it becomes really important for when we're going to talk about changing deserts over time in a few years time. And that's how atmospheric circulation. Okay, the way that the atmosphere circulates air produces on a continental scale areas of low rainfall and those areas typically are characterised by large continental scale deserts. Okay, so let's just think a little bit about atmospheric circulation. Now, the key driver of atmospheric circulation, the key reason why air circulates in the atmosphere is because there are differences in temperature across the Earth's surface and differences in temperature drive the circulation of air masses. So at the equator, in the tropics, you get very high surface temperatures. At the poles, at the higher latitudes, you get very low surface temperatures. And that's very simply because the curvature of the Earth means that towards the equator, energy from the sun is spread out over a very small area. So you get a large amount of energy per surface area. So climate scientists talk about watts per meter squared, what's been a measure of energy or power, metre squared being a measurement of area. So at the equator, you get a very high amount of watts per metre squared. But as you go up to the high latitudes, because of the curvature of the Earth, the same amount of energy is spread over a much wider area. And that's why the high latitudes are much colder, because the, air's, the, the energy is spread over a much wider area. You've got less energy per unit area, and those regions are cooler. And it's those differences in temperature between the equator and the high latitude which starts off atmospheric circulation. Effectively, atmospheric circulation moves warm air from the equator towards the pole and cold air from the pole back towards the equator. So why is this relevant to understanding drylands? Well, it's this atmospheric circulation which produces areas of low rainfall, low precipitation, and that controls the location of many of the world's major deserts. So let's just explain how that works. So let's think about the low latitudes. Let's think about circulation around the tropics. So at the equator, you get maximum incoming radiation, maximum energy coming in from the sun. Land and ocean heats up. That heats up the air in the atmosphere. And air, when it heats, expands. It becomes less dense, and so it rises. Think about a hot air balloon. A hot air balloon flies because you fill up the air with air which is much hotter than the surrounding air. The air in the balloon expands, it becomes less dense, and it rises. Now, as air rises, it goes from being very warm to being cooler as it moves up through the atmosphere. That means that any water vapour in the air condenses because cold air holds less water vapour than warm air. It condenses into clouds and you get intense rainfall. So around the equator, you get very warm climates, but also very wet climates. And that's why in that region, you get tropical rainforests. The really warm climate, the high moisture availability, really encourages plant growth and biomass development, and that produces tropical rainforests. Now, as that air is rising around the equator, it draws air in from the mid latitudes to replace it, so air flows towards the equator. And the air which is rising, as it cools in the atmosphere, it gradually becomes more dense, it begins to descend, and it comes down towards the Earth's surface at around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south of the equator. Now, when air descends, it goes from being cold to be warm. That means that any water vapour it's holding stays as water vapour. You don't get condensation, you don't get cloud development, and therefore you get minimal rainfall and very dry conditions. So where that air descends towards the Earth's surface are very dry areas, and 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, therefore, are major dryland regions. 
And if you think about where the Sahara Desert is, where the Arabian Desert is, where the Central Australian Desert is, they are all at 30 degrees north or south of the equator. And that's because they are in that location where this descending air produces very dry conditions. Now, area, air which is rising up away from the Earth's surface means that the pressure is being lifted away from the Earth's surface, so those are zones of low pressure. Areas where air is descending towards the Earth's surface, air is pushing down on the Earth's surface, so they're areas of high atmospheric pressure. And if you ever watch weather forecast, meteorologists refer to low pressure zones, which is where air is descending, they're always associated with rainfall, and high pressure zones, where the air is descending, um, and that is always produced associated with dry or low rainfall conditions. And it's this circulation system which uh, controls the location of many of the world's major deserts. And that's important because, as we'll see um, in a few moments, the reason that the location of deserts change, or the reason why deserts expand or contract, is strongly associated with the operation of that high pressure system. Okay, so now we've understood why drylands and deserts occur where they occur, what we want to do now is think about how they change over time. And the one thing that scientists are aware of is there's quite a lot of evidence now that over time, over thousands of years, deserts have undergone regular expansion and contraction. And the evidence, some, some of the evidence for this we've already discussed. So in areas like the Sahara, Sahara and the Arabian Desert, you find evidence for extensive lake beds, um, evidence from microfossils, that these were permanent freshwater bodies, many metres deep, and also evidence from shells and bones and teeth that mollusks um, and animals lived in these landscapes which required wetter conditions, evidence for lush savanna grasslands extending across most of the Sahara and most of Arabia, and also evidence that humans lived in these landscapes, migrated across these landscapes, and from about 10,000 years ago, farmed these landscapes. And on the other end of the spectrum, we also have evidence that deserts in the past expanded. So in areas like the Amazon rainforest, you have dense vegetated woodland overlying fossilised sand dunes. Evidence for periods of time when the climate was a lot drier, when sand dunes migrated backwards and forwards, and the deserts of the world were more expanded. OK, so if we think about, say, the last 20,000 years, we can see very clear patterns in the history of drylands. So from about 20,000 years ago to about 14,000 years ago, the deserts of the world were more exp ex expanded. The Sahara was more extensive, it extended further north and south. Areas like Amazonia were encroached by desert. There's evidence around most of the deserts today of fossil aeolian dune systems, sand dune systems, where now the landscape is quite heavily vegetated. From about 12,000 years ago to about 6,000 years ago, many of the world's deserts contracted. Okay, So you have this period in North Africa, known as the African Humid Period, when climates were wetter than they are at the present day in those deserts, and sometimes this is referred to as periods of the Green Sahara, a period of time when the Sahara was lush grassland with lakes and river systems flowing across what is now desert. From about 6,000 years ago, the deserts start to expand again. You start to get more arid condition. These grasslands break up and we see the deserts that we see at the present day established. Now, I guess the key question is, you know, what causes that? Why do these deserts expand and contract over time? Well, what causes long-term variation in the Earth's climate is primarily changes in the Earth's orbit. So over regular time scales, the shape of the Earth's orbit, the tilt of the Earth's axis change. Uh, the Earth's orbit goes from being near circular to more like an ellipse or an oval over 100,000 year cycles. And the Earth's orbit tilts. Sometimes the, uh, the tilt is slightly steeper, sometimes in slightly shallower. And this again occurs over many thousands of years. Now, what these changes in orbit do is control the ice ages. So when we have large global ice ages, and we've had many of them over the last two million years, 
it's normally because there's a reduced amount of energy coming in to the northern hemisphere and that's controlled by the shape of the Earth's orbit and the tilt of the Earth's axis. And when energy from the Sun is reduced because of those parameters, you start to get major ice sheets developing. And generally speaking, the time of maximum desert expansion corresponds with the time of these global glaciations. Um, well, why is that? Well, the Earth's a lot colder. And if you think about it, what we've already said, colder sea surface temperatures would mean less evaporation, so less moisture in the atmosphere. Colder air temperature would mean that the atmosphere can hold less moisture, so there's less precipitation. And during an ice age, you have a big ice cap over all of uh, Canada and the northern parts of the United States. You have a large ice sheet over northern Britain. You have a big sharp ice sheet over most of Scandinavia. And what that means is lots of atmospheric moisture, which would normally be rainfall, is in fact locked up in ice sheets. So when you have a global glaciation, the world is automatically much drier, and as a result, desert expands. So 20,000 years ago was what we refer to as the last glacial maximum, or the LGM, the last time these big global glaciations occurred, and so the last time that you had this big global expansion in deserts. From about 20,000 years ago, the Earth's orbit is gradually changing, and it's gradually changing so you get more energy coming in from the Sun in the Northern Hemisphere. That causes ice sheets to contract. And automatically the Earth starts to warm. That means that you start to get more moisture in the landscape, more moisture in the atmosphere, and more available moisture to feed rainfall. And that automatically causes the deserts to start to contract. Now, around about 10,000 years ago, the energy coming in to the Northern Hemisphere reaches its maximum. And that does two things. Firstly, it means that the tilt of the Earth's axis shifts that equatorial area of low pressure that we talked about, where you have rising air, it shifts it slightly further northwards. So you start to get more of that tropical rainfall going further north into the Sahara, into the Arabian deserts. So you start to get wetter conditions because of the change in the Earth's orbit. And also that maximum of energy coming into the Northern Hemisphere produces strong gradients across the hemisphere that drives the monsoon harder and you start to get more rainfall going further north into areas like the Sahara. From about 8,000 years ago, the Earth's orbital configuration starts to change again. The Earth's orbit and axis change. You start to get less energy coming in, the monsoon subsides, and the zone of high rainfall associated with the tropical low pressure zone shifts back further south. So effectively what you see over the last 20,000 years is gradual changes in the shape of the Earth's orbit, the tilt of the Earth's axis, which initially causes global glaciation 20,000 years ago, very dry conditions across the uh, whole Earth because it's so cold and so much water is locked up in ice sheets, that causes major expansion of deserts. Then maximum energy around about 10,000, 11,000 years ago, hitting the Northern Hemisphere, causing the rain belts to shift, shift north and strong gradients um, in temperature across the hemispheres, producing really strong monsoons. That causes increased wetness in the world's deserts, greener conditions in those deserts, and this produces the Green Sahara and the African Human Period. And then a gradual change in the Earth's orbit again from 8,000 years onwards, causing a reduction in the monsoon, a shift south in those rain belts, the drying of the deserts to the conditions we see at the present day. And those changes in the Earth's orbit, causing the change in the desert region, have had huge implications for us because periods of time when humans have migrated out of Africa, the um, you know, our species originates in East Africa, those periods of time when humans disperse and leave Africa require us to migrate across what are now deserts. And that's allowable because of those time periods when the Earth's orbit has changed, the deserts become humid, and you can have pathways for migration across the desert. And you look at periods of time, you know, look at the African humid period, 
What we can see across what is now arid and hyper-arid conditions is evidence for relatively large communities, farming practice, agricultural practices occurring right across the Sahara. And this diagram I'm showing you now, I don't expect you to get the details of this, but all it's showing is the last 11, 12,000 years, and that green period running through the middle is evidence across the Sahara, dated by radiocarbon dating, of agricultural activity, therefore wetter conditions. And you can see this very tight band between about 10,000 and 6,000 years when agricultural communities were sustainable in the Sahara. Before that, the climate was too arid because of global glaciation, and since then, the Sahara has become too arid because the changes in the Earth's orbit have caused the deserts to become drier again. Okay, so that's drylands in the past. What about drylands in the future? Because one of the things that we're aware of is the climate is changing, the world is warming, and this is causing major changes in climate patterns across the Earth's surface. Now, of course, most of the time we talk about global warming, and scientists, and I'm going to refer here to the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, produce climate projections, okay? So here's one for temperature. Now, when people produce these climate model predictions, it's not a single climate model. Countries around the world, scientific uh, groups across the world are producing climate models. This is an average of all of those models put together. They're an average of what we think might happen. And we can see that the pattern for the world, this is for about 2100, the pattern of the world is warmer, but of course there's spatial variability. Some areas of the world become a lot warmer than others. Now, although there is variability between climate models about exactly how warm we will get, all of these models show warming. Temperature is generally much easier to predict and forecast than rainfall. Okay? So if we look at models for rainfall in 2100, so that's approximately 80 years in the future, what we see is much more uncertainty. So this map I'm showing you, areas which are browns, reds, oranges are getting drier. Areas with greens and blues are getting wetter. Areas which are white are areas where scientists don't have much confidence in predictions. So what we're saying is, if we think about all of the climate models which are being used, um, there's general disagreement between the models about what will happen. So you can see various regions of the world where climate models disagree. The stippled areas are the areas where there is really good, strong agreement between different climate models. And you can see that areas with quite good agreement are those areas around current, de current desert regions. And what this model prediction produced by the IPCC shows is that the areas around deserts are predicted to get drier. So look at the Mediterranean, for example. You can see there, you've got the stipple, so it shows there's good agreement between models, so good confidence that we understand what will happen in the future. And you can see that in both winter and summer, the Mediterranean is going to get drier. And that's true of almost all the major desert regions of the world. Now, why is that? Well, think back to what we talked about in terms of atmospheric circulation. Large deserts such as the Sahara occur where they do because of that high pressure zone at around 30 degrees. Most climate models suggest that in a warmer world, the influence of that high pressure zone will extend poleward. So in the northern hemisphere, the Sahara will expand northwards, and in the southern hemisphere, towards the southern part of that, the Sahara will extend southwards. And this means that areas like the Mediterranean, which are now mostly semi-arid or dry subhumid, if you think back to our aridity index calculation, are predicted to become more extensively semi-arid or even, in some cases, arid. So the future for dryland regions is actually dryland regions will become more extensive. Um, think back to that table I showed you earlier, approximately 40% of the Earth's surface is currently dryland. That's going to get greater, that's going to get more extensive. 
And if you think about you know, where that population is, so approximately 35% of the world's population live in dryland regions, at the present day, the majority of those live in semi-arid, dry, subhumid regions. But what this model is showing us is that in the future, more semi-arid and dry, subhumid regions will become arid and semi-arid. So this very high amount of population which lives in the wetter, moister part of the drylands will suddenly be subjected to much more arid conditions. And the big concern about the expansion of dryland in the future is that those areas will become under increasing water availability stress, that those populations will have less access to the water they need, both for drinking and for irrigation. And areas like the Mediterranean are quite often thought of as very sensitive areas to global warming simply because by lying on that boundary between arid North Africa and subhumid, humid uh, Central and Northern Europe, you're on a climatic boundary. And most models of global warming indicate that it's those regions on that climatic boundary which are going to become under stress and put under stress as climates change and as deserts expand poles. Okay, so I hope in today's talk that you've seen that, you know, you know we hopefully get a good under idea of what drylands are, that we understand, you know, because of geographic factors, why drylands occur where they do, that you've got a bit of an understanding about how drylands have changed in the past and why, and finally, that now you've got an idea about what might happen to drylands in the future. So next week, we're going to be running a question and answer session on drylands. I'm going to be live on live answering any questions you have. Um, if you've got any questions, email me. My email address is ian.candy at rhul.ac.uk or post questions um, online below this video. Or if you want to log in next week, um, you can ask questions in real time as we uh, discuss drylands in a changing world. Thanks very much for your time and I hope to see you next week.